In the crazy world of retail, one name stands out above all the others. That name is Target. Target is one of the largest retailers in the world, with nearly 2,000 stores and over $100 billion in revenue each and every year. Just in the last three years alone, Target has grown over a massive $30 billion and shows no signs of slowing down. However, very few people know that the history of Target actually dates all the way back to the late 1800s in Minnesota, where a young man with dreams of becoming a minister saw an opportunity that would change the retail market forever. In this video, we'll dive into Target's insane rise to the top as well as to why shoppers prefer Target over their main competitor, Walmart. We'll also explore some of Target's controversies, such as the time when they were even sued for overcharging their customers. This is the untold truth about Target. George Draper Dayton was born in 1857 in Clifton Springs, New York. His family had very little means, and with seven children to feed, the family would barely make enough to not go hungry. Even though George's father was a physician, he didn't make much money. So at a young age, George would take on small jobs to help provide for the family. Despite not having much, George's parents made sure to instill strong religious values in their children. This inspired George, and he dreamed of one day becoming a minister, giving big sermons and having a profound impact on his community. However, that dream would be short-lived, because in 1873, an economic panic swept the nation. This would forever be known as the Long Depression. Similar to the Great Depression, the Long Depression crippled the economy. It all started when one of the largest banks in New York, called Jay Cook & Company, invested most of their money in the railroads. However, when the railroads started having a lot of problems, the company went bankrupt. When people heard that the biggest bank in New York had failed, they all rushed to their banks to demand their money back. This caused a nationwide panic that caused over a hundred banks to fail, crippling the economy. Because of this, George's father arranged for him to have an apprenticeship in nursery, coal, and the lumber yard. And at age 16, George would be forced to put his dreams of becoming a minister aside to focus on manual labor. However, this experience would have a huge impact on George. And as he learned more about the business world, he developed a strong passion for it. Over the next few years, he would learn all about trade, management, and investments. During this time with the apprenticeship, he would also meet his wife, Emma, and the two started a family together. One day while at work, George began hearing of great investment opportunities in the Midwest, particularly in Minnesota. So George, along with a few other investors, began buying up farm mortgages in Minnesota. And while there, he came across his biggest opportunity yet. He noticed a small city in Minnesota called Worthington. The city showed great potential in agriculture, but had been devastated by the civil war and the financial crisis, and was in dire need of a savior. So at 26 years old, George packed his bags with his family and left New York, with his eyes set on building Worthington into a thriving city. After arriving in Worthington in 1883, George set his sights on the Worthington Bank, which stood as a cornerstone of the community. George didn't know much about the banking business, but the opportunity was too good to pass up. So while being backed by a few investors, he took control of the Worthington Bank. However, this was no easy task. Because of the many downfalls of the economy, a lot of people were very upset with the banks and didn't trust them. George, however, saw this as a great opportunity to connect with the people of the community. Because of his religious background, 
He would become very active in the city's local church, and he and his wife would even teach Sunday school. He also joined the local board of education, hosted community events at his house, and was extremely committed to keeping ethical banking practices. This instilled a great deal of trust throughout the community, and many began to look at George as a hero of the city. But in 1893, tragedy would again strike the economy, and another depression swept the nation. Over 500 banks failed during this collapse, and many cities struggled. However, George vowed to keep his bank's doors open, no matter what. As the people panicked, George reassured them that their money was safe, and he met every single demand during the Depression, even diving into his own personal pockets to keep everyone happy. Because of this, the entire city survived the crisis, and George was praised for his resilience and keeping the trust of the community. Also during this time, another tragedy struck a community church in Minneapolis. The entire church caught on fire and burned to the ground. The church's insurance wouldn't cover the damages, so they were looking for help in purchasing a new building. George, now a successful banker, decided to buy an empty lot to fund the church's reconstruction. He built a large six-storey building and convinced a local department store called Goodfellows to move their business into the new building. The owner, however, decided to completely sell the store to George, and so he renamed it to Dayton's Dry Goods Company in 1903. Little did George know that this department store would one day become the massive retail empire known as Target. George operated the company like a family business, and so he enforced strict religious guidelines. He refused to sell alcohol at his store and wouldn't allow any business activity on Sundays. With George's work ethic and leadership, the store would grow into a multi-million dollar business over the next 20 years. George then decided that it was time to pass the company on to his son, Nelson, and he dedicated the rest of his days to helping his community. George died in 1938 at 80 years old. With the company's future now resting on his shoulders, Nelson would vow to continue his father's legacy and uphold the religious values that his father left. Nelson carried the company through many tough times, including World War II. And in 1944, Dayton became the first store in the United States to offer their workers retirement benefits. Nelson's control of the company, however, would be cut tragically short, and he died at just 64 years old in 1950. He was then replaced by his son Douglas, who ran the company along with his five brothers. Douglas and his brothers, however, had a very different vision than their predecessors. They ditched the religious guidelines. They began selling alcohol and opened the store on Sundays, the complete opposite of what George had wanted. The new team also implemented a more aggressive style of management and expansion. In 1956, the company opened up a new shopping mall right outside of Minneapolis called Southdale Shopping Center, creating the world's first ever fully indoor shopping mall. The shopping center was a huge success, but just a few years later, the Dayton company would be completely transformed, shaping the future of retail as we know it. Hey guys, if you've enjoyed this video so far, please do me a huge favor and hit the like button and subscribe. I'll be posting exciting stories on business, money, and crime. So also make sure to turn on post notifications so you'll be the first to see them. Thank you so much for your support. You're the absolute best. Now let's get back to this crazy story. In the early 1960s, one of the workers at Dayton named John Geis saw a huge business opportunity. John was very inspired by the rise of a new discount store called Kmart and believed that this new business model was the future of retail. His idea was to take the class and quality of the Dayton company and blend it with the discount store model, creating an upscale discount store. 
However, when Geis pitched the idea, it wasn't immediately welcomed with open arms by the others. Many experts saw it as a risky move because Dayton was already established as a suburban department store. However, Douglas Dayton loved the idea, and so he decided to team up with Geis on this new retail store. They decided to name the new store Target, so it wouldn't be confused with their traditional department store. John's vision, combined with Douglas's leadership, merged the best of the fashion world with the best of the discount world, creating a shopping experience like never before. In 1962, Target officially opened and was a major hit across all of Minnesota. The people loved how they could buy high-quality items at affordable prices, and within one year, Target opened four new stores all across Minnesota. Target's sales would skyrocket, and by 1968, the company was doing over $100 million in sales. That same year, John Geis left Target and went on to help build multiple companies. He actually became good friends with Sam Walton of Walmart, and the two partnered together in a new company that the world would come to know as Sam's Club. Even with John gone, Target's growth continued to soar over many decades. Fast forward to today, and Target is the eighth largest retailer in the US, with nearly 2,000 stores and over $100 billion in revenue every year. Now, while these numbers are very impressive, it's still nowhere near Target's biggest competitor, Walmart. Walmart is Target's biggest competitor. While Target does over $100 billion in revenue every year, Walmart does six times that, with over $600 billion. And while Target has over 2,000 locations, Walmart has nearly 11,000 all across the world. Now, despite Walmart having a huge lead in sales and locations, a lot of customers actually prefer to shop at Target instead of Walmart. But the question is, why? Let's explore. First, there's the look. A lot of people find Target to be easier on the eyes. The aisles are wider, the shelves are better organized, and the color red seems to give a feeling of youth and excitement. Compared with Walmart's design of their signature blue, many feel that the store looks dull and not as exciting. Next, there's the items. Since Target started by having upscale items at affordable prices, a lot of shoppers still look at Target as a quality store. On the other hand, since Walmart focuses so heavily on having the cheapest items around, customers mostly see it as a place to buy just the basic items and not quality items. Target is also known for having better customer service than Walmart, as well as treating their employees better. All of these key factors make a huge difference in the overall shopping experience. Now, Target is in no means perfect. In fact, Target was even sued for overcharging their customers on their own app. In 2022, a man walked into a Target store to buy some groceries, only to discover that after he purchased his two boxes of crackers, he was charged $3.79 instead of $3.49. Enraged by the situation, the man filed a class action lawsuit against Target, and Target was fined $5 million for having inconsistent pricing. Fast forward one year later, and Target would find itself again involved in multiple lawsuits and heavy backlash, with many saying that the company has completely given up on their values and only care about profits. Nonetheless, Target still remains one of the most recognized brands in the world, and it all started with a young man who had a dream of helping his community. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this story, then you won't believe how a young man built the most illegal website in the world, exclusively on BizFlix.